Professor Jordan Fisher. Um, I am part of the MLS program and the JD program at the Klein School of Law. I am very excited to be kicking off our VCO panels tonight with the Cybersecurity and Data Privacy panel. Um, some of you may be taking my class, EU Data Privacy, um, or you may see, I would, I would normally say see me walking around, uh, around school, but that's not happening this, this fall semester as much. Um, but we're very, very excited to have you all here and to have this conversation around what it's like to have a data privacy and cybersecurity career and a job in this field. Um, before we kick off our panelists and introduce everyone, I'm going to turn um, the conversation over to Laurel who is a professor in the VCO program, who's gonna give a little bit of insight into the VCO program. So Laurel, I'll let you um, go ahead and uh, share your screen and take over. So hello and welcome. Uh, I'm also a professor in the Drexel School of Law. I teach the introduction to the legal system. And as my day job, I'm an attorney uh, in a, for a software company and do deal with compliance as it relates to my customers, which are primarily the federal government, state and local governments, um, municipalities, counties. Okay, so I think you already heard a little bit about me. Like I said, for my day job, I'm an attorney. What I wanna share with you guys today is about the virtual career office at Drexel. The virtual career office is something that my colleague here on the call, Paul Flanagan, and another uh, adjunct professor here at Drexel, Laura Jacobus and I have uh, sort of started and created it's it's not too nascent it's been going now for a little while more than a year i guess or just about a year so what the virtual career office has is it's got modules it's set up like a class but it's sort of a choose your own adventure class so there's seven modules uh, but you don't have to do them in a particular order there are modules on things like interviewing on things like your elevator pitch on things like um, finding your dream job um, questions about your own skills and abilities and how to apply those to new and different jobs some of our students um, some of you, I, I would guess a lot of you on the call are already students in the program. Some of you might be prospective students, but the, but the intention of the VCO is while you're getting an, an additional certification or additional degree towards what we assume is either um, advancement in your career or a change, a second career, a change in your career, how this, the, this tool is designed to help you do that. So there's short exercises, there are videos, there are career, career resources, things like trade organizations. There's a dynamic portion with a job bank. We've done some live Zoom sessions with current students. Um, oops. Um, and, and really that's, that's kind of a, the gist of it as to who we are. Um, our contact information is here and as well, Paul Flanagan's on the call um, and he's also one of the contacts, but just wanted to share with you guys a little bit about what the virtual career office is and it is developing. There's, like I said, portions of it that are dynamic um, portions of, of this evening may um, most likely will end up there in the in the VCO. Um, but we do encourage you guys to current students in particular, you have access, prospective students, if you become students, that this is a resource that's available to you. Um, we hope that you explore it, you use it, and you reach out to us and you know provide us your comments. And there's also mentoring available through this product. So once you get through um, these modules or a portion of the modules, you then have the ability to, to contact us personally and we'll, we'll assign you to a mentor that's most appropriate to your career goals. Thank you so much, Laurel. And the VCO is the reason that we are all sitting here today and have such a fantastic group of panelists who are gonna talk through sort of what it is like in the cyber privacy tech space to work in this space. And we brought together a really diverse group on purpose because this is a very diverse area to practice in. And I use practice because I'm a lawyer, but it's more than just practicing. It's um, so many different facets. And so I'm super excited to talk to everybody. What I'm going to do is ask each of the panelists to introduce themselves and to answer sort of this general question to start to kick off the panel, which is what is a typical day like in your work life? Um, and I would say I'm sure many of the panelists uh, have different days today than they did maybe six or <laughs> 10 months ago. <laughs> um, so, you know, feel free to delve into that. I think privacy, tech, and security has a heightened sort of role in the current pandemic environment. And that's definitely something that a lot of the students are, are themselves probably aware of. Um, two of our panelists are alumni of the program um, at Drexel. 
Um, and so I'm going to kick it off with the two of you first. So sorry, both of you. <laughs> it's coming in your direction. Um, so um, Craig and Brian both uh, um, went to uh, went through Drexel for the certificate program. And so they can speak not only to their current careers, but also having been in the program. So Craig, since you took your mute off, you have the <laughs> lucky winning ticket. So if you can introduce yourself and then just give us a sense of your typical day in your work life. Great. So hi, everybody. Craig Battleman here. I work for IBM Security, uh, work out of the house in uh, Chicago. And interestingly enough, uh, my job has pretty much remained the same uh, from pre-COVID to post-COVID here. So, um, you know, it's just one of those things, the nature of the work I do. So I work in, uh, I have two basic job functions uh, within IBM Security. I'm helping uh, my management team put together a worldwide alliance partner management program. Uh, so a lot of work there involves uh, identifying what partners will be in the program, uh, what partners have to do uh, in terms of prerequisites or requirements, and then what benefits do they achieve, and how do we make sure all of that is legally compliant and transparent and equitable. So uh, we have about 100 partners around the uh, global partners around the world and many more in each geography. So it's uh, something that we're doing for the first time. Very important. The second is I also manage a number of more strategic partner relationships. So not only do I help build the program, but I manage a couple partners and, you know, daily responsibilities in that area tend to fall into a lot of support roles, uh, helping the partners uh, that I'm managing as well as our offering development teams uh, develop service offerings, which has a lot of legal and compliance work, uh, a lot of risk management work, uh, a lot of uh, business development activities. And so every day there's numerous meetings across both those different job functions, um, meeting a lot with partners and meeting with prospective partners as well. Uh, to help them understand what it means to work with IBM security and you know what they're uh, what they're in for you know so they have proper expectations Brian I want to turn it over to you oh my name is Brian Pizzillo I'm uh, an attorney I've been practicing for close to 25 years now um, somebody was mentioning it was after dinner time so this was a great time to do this it's only four o'clock where I am I'm in Las <laughs> Vegas where it's a frigid 95 degrees so uh, for somebody who said it was really cold outside I've yet to experience that maybe in a few months. Um, uh, yeah, I was actually lucky enough to go through this program. Uh, Jordan was one of my professors and it was a, uh, it, it's actually a great program. Um, it was very different than what I had done in the past, which is a lot of litigation with a lot of um, emphasis on construction clients. And now I'm transitioning very much into kind of being a resource of answering a lot of questions, both in-house for my own partners who come to me and outside clients a lot of times saying, what's up with this privacy thing? Do I really need to worry about it? And when I say How yes, they spell privacy. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. They spell it with a dollar sign typically, and they, they want to know how many, how much money does it cost them to be compliant? Um, and it, it's been very interesting because it's taken on a role of kind of cross practice groups. So a lot of people in my firm do intellectual property, mergers and acquisitions, things of that nature. And then they've now started coming to me with questions like, okay, we're doing this merger and acquisition. Hey, you know, privacy policies, things like that. Can you look all this stuff over? We kind of always ignored it in the past because it was just one of those things. Um, and now, particularly, I think with the pandemic, people working at home, I have a lot of clients who start calling in now saying, you know, we know this privacy thing is for real and it's here to stay, but what do we actually need to do? What's a privacy policy? How am I supposed to be in compliance? And for a lot of uh, clients I've dealt with, the question has been, where do I need to be in compliance? Um, you know, some of them operate worldwide, some are just in the US, but in different states. Um, and I've seen now a lot more people coming, going, well, we, we think we've had a data breach, but we don't actually know what a breach means. What, how do we handle that? It's been, it, it's been uh, actually very exciting because for me, not having a tech background, um, I've kind of played that intermediary role of um, being part of a team where there's somebody out there doing the IT stuff for me to come in and do the kind of the legal analysis and then try to convince people at the uh, C-suite level that, you know, they really need to be paying attention to this and, and getting buy-in um, has been has been very interesting and it's evolving every day. And so my, I don't know what a typical day is. I don't think I've had one in so long that it's, I, I've forgotten. Um, but it one day is completely 
dead, I hear nothing. And then the next day, our, our client saying, oh my God, this is an emergency. We've got to get this done. Um, so it changes, which I think is actually kind of one of the fun parts. It's, it's, it's been very dynamic. Yeah. And I think it shows the, the, the pain where you sit in the cyber and privacy, especially if you're on the response side with the breaches can be very dynamic and changing very quickly. Um, and so requires um, almost that sort of first responder type of lifestyle yeah. where you're sort of responding to that. So that's a great point. Um, and I think a natural segue from a lawyer is insurance. <laughs> so I, I'd like to have Austin go next and talk about what he is doing in cyber and privacy. I'm Austin Morris Jr. I'm with Morris Risk Management. We're a full service insurance brokerage. We offer forms of insurance you have heard of and some you definitely never have and have not heard of. And that's okay because the key reason we're involved in this conversation is we're very uh, knowledgeable and very experienced in something called cyber insurance. It has different names. It includes data privacy insurance. There's other names for it, but really it's just called cyber insurance. And it is a ton of fun because who would think insurance is fun, but I tell you, I can't get out, wait to get out of bed in the morning and get to work and actually read the emails because it's really dynamic. There's a ton of really interesting and smart people in the cyber insurance space. That does not include me or my colleagues. That means the underwriters and the people at the insurance companies and the lawyers we work with and all the forensics people. It is really fascinating because the problem's really big. The cyber problem, the events, the incidents are growing in volume and severity. So where do we come into play and what's a typical day like to answer Jordan's question? Well, we're offering all kinds of insurance and we have a lot of expertise in different forms, but for cyber insurance, we get involved in conversations before something happens and after something happens. What does that mean before? Well, we're hopefully going to be talking to the clients and we're almost always talking at the executive level or the ownership level of organizations we deal with because that's where the responsibility falls. They are responsible. It's not an IT problem. It's often tied to IT. It's often that IT is very important, but this is a fiduciary responsibility in an organization. That means it's a risk management and a liability issue and really CFOs and CEOs and boards of directors should be involved in this if they take the time to put the effort into it. So we're talking with them about what do they do, what's the nature of their business. We try to uncover risks and things that are vulnerabilities. And then we explain to them how the insurance is just one part of a holistic approach. You need to do what Jordan does and what Brian does and anybody else on this screen. You need to do what Rosemary does, which is put together a plan to handle how you're going to manage data, what frameworks you might use, what legal reviews you're going to do, what you're gonna do as far as managing your technologies, there is no single technology that push a button and we're safe. No technology can protect you by itself. And that's foolish if you think that because people all think I'm just gonna buy something and now I can look away and I'm okay. So this is a human problem, humans make mistakes. And so we're dealing with humans explaining the situation, asking them knowledge questions that come from our knowledge base. We've kind of developed a, a format to ask the right questions at the right time. And then we help them to understand what insurance could do and that's a risk transfer so students, that's actually insurance says, if you pay a certain amount of money, which is your premium, you can then know that the insurance company is not only going to help you to get out of the trouble you're in when the event happens, but they'll help to improve your situation. The cyber insurance nowadays doesn't just get your system back to where it was because then you're still vulnerable. It gets you to a better place. So we actually explain to the clients how this is protecting the bottom line of the organization and how it allows you to get services brought to you to help you much faster than you could buy yourself. So let's give an example why I think it's so interesting. If you're a student and you now have sitting in the CEO's office or the CFO's office of some company, it's your own company one day hopefully, and now the problem happens. Are you gonna go out to the market and try to find all the specialists, forensics people and everybody else in public relations firms and buy their services, not knowing who to buy from, you're under pressure, you have regulatory potential, potential regulatory pressure on you. Your customers are saying, wait a minute, where's your services? I can't access you guys, or even your phones are down. And then you're actually gonna pay a very marked up price because you're buying under duress. So the insurance allows you to transfer at risk for the price of the insurance policy to these companies, the insurance companies who have pre-bought these services from top providers. And then what they do is they bring them to your, to your help when you need it. And then afterwards, we're in conversations afterwards because we're trying to make sure clients are helped after the case is done and closed. And what can they do to become more resilient? What do they learn from it? So we don't just sell the insurance, we feel like we're a partner start to finish. Why is that helpful in the day, day to day? Every day we're talking to people about unique situations. Every company's different. Every company has a different value system on what they do and what their client bases are, and what's part, what part of the supply chains they're in and who their partners are. So bottom 
thing I want to take away from this is our days are never the same. We are now, of course, meeting virtually, but in normal times, we're in a lot of face-to-face -face meetings and we're sitting down with clients and we get to hear their real concerns. So I feel like our job is a very personalized job that day-to-day -day is fascinating and I just can't wait, to go to work, can't wait to go to work every day. And I feel like that's a special thing that you should consider as students that if you're in certain parts of insurance, it's never boring. It's a global industry with, with many, many interesting facets. Yeah, and I think it's just cyber and privacy is so dynamic. And one of the reasons um, I, too, enjoy insurance, <laughs> maybe not the same level as often. <laughs> but, you know, I think one of the things that's, that's so dynamic is that because cyber and privacy, it's not very stagnant. You know, every breach, every incident, the new technologies are changing, the threats are changing. And so it's, it's, we talk about a journey and privacy and security is a journey. And it's so great to work in a space because you're part of that journey. You're sort of growing with an industry, you're growing with technology. Um, you know, I, I, I often tell students, I didn't go to law school that long ago, but I didn't even have security and privacy classes. Like this was not even something that necessarily would have been discussed. And here we are, and we're having these full-blown conversations, and there's many, many different career opportunities. So I think that dynamic part that Austin's talking about is, I think what you're going to hear a theme of is that all of us are going to be able to sort of say that no day is the same, and it's partially because no technology is the same. Things are changing so rapidly. Um, you know, maybe some of us wish we could sleep a little bit more, but <laughs> it's still fun, though, like Austin said. Um, so I want to turn it over to Ryan, because I think Austin sort of talking about that holistic approach really lends itself well to sort of sure. Ryan's uh, sort of piece of this as well. So I'll turn it over to you, Ryan. Sure. So like Austin, I think I have the best job in the world. And uh, <laughs> um, uh, so I run a small consultancy called Dayspring Technology. We are management consultants for highly regulated industries. Um, our focus is security and privacy. Um, so when I say highly regulated industry, that would be insurance, that would be life sciences, um, some, uh, some technologies, things like that. And as you know, if there are government regulations or state regulations, things like that, um, or even self-imposed regulations such as ISO standards, um, as Jordan mentioned, none of that is a checklist, uh, you know, a do it and forget it. It's a journey. It's a, it's, I use the term workflow, right? You're, you're constantly uh, following processes and adjusting how they, they work in, in a changing world. Um, my job is to build all those processes. Um, so for example, if I'm doing risk assessments, Austin, I might, one of my choices is give this to the insurance companies, right? This is a risk. It's a problem. We're not going to buy some technology. We're going to let Austin take care of this for us. Um, so as a consultant, I, see just about any different kind of business in all sorts of different places. And so I, I have the, the luxury of working from home uh, pre-COVID, but then I also have the luxury of seeing the entire world. My work has taken me to Israel, it's taken me to Europe, it's taken me to Southern California. Um, anywhere you wanna go with this, you can. And I, I am energized by that. Some people don't enjoy that. I'm energized by that kind of travel and changing customers and changing environments. Um, this year alone, we're working with a $26 billion company and a 27 person startup that invented a ventilator product that is helping people with COVID-19. Um, really cool diversity of work. Um, so a typical day, I use a lot of the same tools. So whether it is helping someone comply with a standard, here's what that standard says, and, you know, this is, that's where um, attorney skills come in. So, you know, Jordan and I have chatted about different things. Um, what does this law actually mean? Can you explain these words to me? Um, and then once I know, I can run with it. Um, but lots of diversity and building those frameworks, they're never the same way twice. You might have the same requirement, but it's going to look a lot different at a $26 billion multinational then it will look at a 27 person company that is trying, you know, that, that has just learned that they need to lock the front door, right? There's a lot of differences in there. Um, I will say I never run out of work. Um, and when we get to a point where my customers will allow me to travel, that's when the days go from relatively normal to 10, 12 hour days where I'm falling asleep in a hotel room with my laptop open. Um, so it's, uh, it's intense. 
but it is, um, it's very rewarding. I think my favorite part of the job is that I know I am helping companies and really people with real things, right? If you give your information to a healthcare company and I'm helping protect that, or I'm helping a company that's making a product that helps people with COVID-19. And I'm saying, if you do these things, you will be compliant with HIPAA legislation. I feel like I'm giving to the world and that's probably the best part of my job. No, I get, that is such a great sentiment. And I think that's such a strong thing we see in the cyber community is that we're all only as strong as our weakest link. And that's literally our weakest person. And so teaching those skills, it's so great when you go into a company, you're not only helping them at that corporate level, but someone goes, oh, I could go home and add this technology onto my free Gmail account or something. And you go, well, you know what? I just improved everybody. Everybody just raised up just a little bit. And so I think that's such a great sentiment. And it really shows that there, there's a, there is a societal aspect to what all of us are working on because we're all interconnected. We're all sitting here on Zoom. We're all on the internet. And it's about sort of understanding how we all relate together and sort of how we all interact. So definitely could not agree more. And last but not least, I want to introduce Rosemary. Um, so I'll kick it over to you to introduce yourself as well. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much, Jordan, for inviting me. And it's awesome to be here. Really excited to talk to all the students um, and help out with careers. So my name's Rosemary Christian. I work for a company called Access IT Group. It's an IT security integrator. Um, right now, I'm the manager of client engagement, but I've done a couple of different things at the company. And um, I'm sure as much of you can tell, I'm a little bit younger and I've only been in the business for about, or the industry, cybersecurity industry for about three and a half years. But my favorite part is that you do get to learn something new every day. Um, so none of my days are the same. It's always changing. Like everyone said, there's new technologies. Um, and as an integrator, it's really cool because we get to learn about all the different products that are helping um, secure different companies. So Access IT has a plethora of different customers. Um, and as the manager of client engagement, I work with not only the customers, but also we have engineers. So we have three separate sides of our business. One that focuses on risk management, which is all of the compliance um, regulations that you guys are mentioning, but also penetration testing, vulnerability assessments. And then we also have uh, cloud services sector. So that focuses mainly on the cloud. Pretty much everybody's in the cloud now. So everyone's trying to figure out how to protect it. What you were talking about sort of gave me, um, you know, reminded me that I think a lot of people, when you hear the word cyber privacy technology, we have this misconception that you need to be a software engineer. You need to be coder, right? Like if I don't know code, I can't get into this space. Um, and, you know, I'd, I'd like to have some of the panelists maybe weigh in on what are the skills that you can bring to the table and, and how should students be thinking about this if they don't necessarily have like a traditional tech background. Um, and I'll say this, when I got into cyber and privacy, I didn't start coding. Um, I can now code, but the expletives that come out of my mouth are not something that anyone wants to be around when it's happening. So, you know, you don't need to have what we can, you know, those traditional, I'm in the tech space, Silicon Valley type of, of background. Um, so I didn't know, and, and Rosemary, maybe I'll kick it over to you first, sort of the skills that students should be thinking about, you know, in the cyber privacy and tech that maybe aren't those traditional development skills. Sure, I can definitely preface that with saying that I don't code myself either. I just work with the engineers. <laughs> so um, it's even more fun just trying to figure out the acronyms as they're talking. So me being the person saying this, I feel even more, you know, sympathy for everyone. Um, and search engines are your friend, okay? Because I find that sometimes when you get into a very techie room, all of a sudden, like the acronyms are flying left and right. And I'm yeah. going, let me just go ahead and search into that because, you know, <laughs> yeah, so don't, that, don't get, yeah. get inundated, basically. <laughs> I think that was one of the best things. I mean, I said it at the beginning, but learning as you go. I mean, the cybersecurity industry is amazing in that sense that I, as I've met more people, everyone wants to teach you something new or teach you a little bit about it, which is something that's really great. And I don't think that that happens a lot in other industries. Um, so I've been able to gain experience from that. And then the other thing that I would really say about cybersecurity and my job in particular, the different skills, is being able to translate some of that tech into normal speak. So having those 
skills to just kind of understand the business, understand different policies, like you guys were saying, um, and I'm sure a lot of the panelists can comment on that, but I think a lot of our jobs are kind of being that translator, being that mediator. So normal yeah. people skills are definitely good. <laughs> Those relationship skills are gonna serve you well no matter what you do, that's so yes. true. <laughs> so, so, so George, my background is actually accounting and finance. Oh, interesting. Okay, I didn't yes. know that. <laughs> yes, actually from Drexel University. So, so I am not natively or naturally a technical person. But what I would say, kind of echoing what Rosemary was saying, is that a lot of the skills you need to use every day, you know, there's about six or seven. And they're not technical necessarily. It helps if you have a technical background or can learn a technical background. But there's a lot of jobs in a technical industry where they're just required to be very analytical and understanding benefits of A versus B and being able to look at A versus B across a, a wide spectrum. Communication skills, I think as, as Rosemary was saying, you've got to be able to communicate with the technical people, with the client, but also with the client's you know, executives and they're not going to be technical. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say curious, you know you, you know, you have to want to learn about the technology. So even if you're not an expert, you at least can start to articulate some technologies and why you might pick some uh, capability over another. Uh, I would say risk management, understanding if I do X or Y, what are the implications? You know, are they significant, minimal, financial, whatever? And then as Rosemary said, relationship management. You know, I work with many different teams and the hardest part of the job is not the technical part. It's actually working with the contractors, working with contract specialists, lawyers, procurement people, the offering managers, the technical teams, the engineers, and you know, not having to be an expert in every single one of those fields. So it's all yes, those things. Knowing the, the questions to ask is really important. And I love the curiosity. And I think that builds on sort of what we, I know Austin was saying this and a couple other panelists of, it's so dynamic and changing, you have to be curious. Because if you yeah. are not curious enough to say, what is that? Why is that changing? What's going on? Um, be excited to read that article or sort of that new information. This is a hard field to stay up with because you're not gonna be able to read something today and have it apply. And frankly, even a week it feels like. <laughs> So, um, Austin, did you have something to say? I saw you took <laughs> I was going to say, Jordan, that you just hit a really important chord there. You said about how it's dynamic and it's changing, and that makes it interesting. Some businesses people go into, they find that, oh, it's really the providence of people have been doing it for 30 years, and they know everything, and that's how it works, because they've been doing they've seen it all and done it all, and they have this, like, seniority over you. That's not the case in cybersecurity. If you're curious, like Craig and everybody else said, if you're interested in people, like Rosemary said, if you're interested in consulting and listening to your clients unique leads, like Brian said, I'm sorry, like Ryan said, and Brian, similar thoughts, and everybody else on the screen, you have no worries that you can be within one or two years a very important person in your organization. You can be highly valuable to clients in a short period of time. There's no such thing as, well, we've always done it this way. It's changing whether you like it or not. The adversary plays by no rules, cyber criminals, nation states, et cetera, et cetera, all the different adversaries, including people sometimes who are malicious insiders on your own team who might cause trouble, or just humans making mistakes. You are gonna learn something every day if you apply yourself, you're gonna be excited every day. And eventually it gets bundled together in your brain where you know it enough to say, I can talk knowledgeably and help people. And once you have that happen, you are empowered because it's not about what you knew before, it's about what you're going to learn tomorrow and what you're going to be able to do to help customers along the way. And the customers are very much in need of your education, your wisdom, and your guidance and your strategies because they truly mostly don't know what to do. It is a fabulous place for a young person to get started in a career. I also want to point out that globally, this is well documented, there are 3 million open cybersecurity jobs in the world. There's 1 million unfilled jobs in the United States. You say 1 million jobs in this economy, yes, because they don't just hire somebody, they're hiring a person who has a certain aptitude. They're maybe curious, maybe they're analytical, maybe they're a problem solver, maybe they're really interested in certain things. You do not need to be a technologist or an attorney to be very successful. You need to be a really curious person who's never afraid to learn, be fearless, and you can be a real, have a really high paying, great career in this space. Um, so as we've heard, 
information changes often, right? So you want to be curious. You want to be collecting as much as you can and learning as quickly as possible. Um, the rest of the planet is trying to do the same thing, right? So as you learn this, this, I used to work in pure IT and we had a problem where I, I used to work in big telecom and there was this information hoarding thing, right? People wanted to learn stuff and not share it. And it was their special corner of the company. Uh, no, not in this industry. Um, I would encourage you to become a listener as well. Because if, if you have unique information that you have assimilated from different clients, from different places, you've seen, you've heard, you've heard a great professor, right? You've heard Jordan speak about uh, the GDPR, right? Collect that. And then if you're working with clients, if you're, if you're asking them, what do you need? Be prepared to listen because people often can't articulate what it is that they're trying to solve. Um, right. I, I heard about this GDPR thing. And if you give people time to talk, they will explain to you why they're struggling. They will explain to you that, you know, their management doesn't understand and won't give them budget and their attorneys are screaming at them because they're not compliant. And, and that's where you can step in that space. If you listen long enough and say, well, I was just, you know, talking with my professor on this, or I was just at another company. And they were able to do this and you can use that experience, but you have to hear the problems first. Uh, that is such a great point, Ryan. And I find so often clients do not know what they need in cyber and privacy and industry does not know what they need in cyber and privacy. And part of it is because it feels like they're opening Pandora's box and then their brain just shuts down. And that's why getting some, and I think it's going to segue nicely into one of the questions um, that we had, but getting some knowledge base by doing um, a certificate program or the MLS program mm -hmm. or having some of that can help. It's almost like it just helps you to listen to identify, oh, okay, Europe, have, I took a class in GDPR or US, are you dealing with children's data? Are you doing health data, et cetera? It's almost like helping you to identify because that's gonna help you to sort of bring, your, bring that sort of global picture into more of like, what do I actually have to get done? So. Yeah. Um, one of the, uh, very quickly, one of the things in the chat, someone was asking about, um, is it easy to switch careers and things like mm -hmm. that? And as with regard to skills, um, I think Craig mentioned he was uh, in accounting. So uh, my degree is biochemistry. I was a lab rat for the first five years of my career. Um, it is, it is not difficult to switch careers. You just have to you have to network, to be honest, and you have to know how to take what you know and use it in other scenarios. Um, so none of the skills we have talked about, right? Nobody mentioned I'm a great Java developer, right? Nobody mentioned um, a very narrow bandwidth type of skill as being really important to succeed in this industry. Uh, what we heard was communication, listening, uh, curiosity, right? These are soft skills, I guess. Um, but it's that type of skill that allows you to jump career, uh, to jump into a new area with your career. That's a great point. Brian, did you have something? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I was just going to add to that because I saw that in the chat and I, you know, from my experience, you know, I went back and I did the certificate program after having practiced for about 22 years and decided to make a change. And, you know, after, you know, two, three years in it, you know, people are now coming to me um, which sometimes still surprises me because I want to sit there and be like, oh, wow, do I really know what I'm talking about? But the answer is if, if you, you know, if you are curious and you want to work hard, yeah, you do. And it's a sought after skill. And I think something, Jordan, you said that uh, usually I, I kind of tell younger lawyers when they come into our firm is it's not really about having the right answer because nobody has all the answers. It's about being able to ask the right questions. And if you open yourself up to a lot of experiences and listening to people um, you know, and in the certificate program, it was, to me, it was amazing because, you know, every class was, was kind of one of those situations of going, wow, I never thought about that. You know, here's something else. And it just builds on itself. And then suddenly you, you know where to seek out the answers and how to research it. And even going back to the first question, you know, what's a typical day? I guess the only thing typical about my day is I usually spend at least the first hour every morning between about 5.30 and 6.30 reading the latest headlines, the latest cases, to the extent you can fit that in one hour. Um, and it, it does change on a daily basis. So it's, there's always something new 
And I think it is what makes it kind of exciting to, to switch if you want to, if you want to do something different. I got tired of litigation. It was, you know, it's obviously by nature, very adversarial. This is more of a teamwork approach. You know, you get to work with people with different disciplines and you're, you're working at putting together um, a problem solving approach. And it's kind of fun to do that on the front end and not, you know, after problems have, uh, have occurred, but helping people avoid them to begin with. Yeah, those are really great points. And it actually makes me think that the course that Brian took on GDPR and the course that Craig took on GDPR and the course that some of you might be taking on GDPR all look very different because the law has changed in the last two years. And so the law and the, and the skills or the, or the, the substantive law and the, the sort of topics you're going to look at are going to change so quickly. It really is those skill sets and that analytical part and being able to think through it. Um, I mean, just the other day, you know, Ryan and I were talking about a new standard in privacy that we're looking at, and that's going to potentially sort of change sort of the way we, the, the way they, that some, some organizations approach it. And, you know, a year ago, we didn't have a California privacy law. Now we have a California privacy law. So it's really about in this space, I think it is being able to recognize when to ask the questions and to be inquisitive and can keep learning. Um, I'm just like Brian and I'm constantly reading <laughs> about a ton of things. I think I spend way more than an hour to be candid because, you know, that's just, it just feels like you need to constantly stay on top of it. So Rosemary, did you have something to add? I think I saw. <laughs> yeah. Um, just to Ryan's point to networking. I mean, and, it, and I think a lot of the other panelists mentioned it too. It's just, um, if you're looking for a position or if you're trying to understand what kind of certification you need, find someone who already has it and talk to, about, talk to them about why they've got it. So then you can kind of assess whether it's the right thing for you. I wouldn't just go grab all the certs just because you're like, oh, everyone has certs. Don't do that. <laughs> Definitely do some analysis on your own part because I had gone down a couple of different paths and that's kind of why I originally talked to Jordan because I was thinking I wanted to go back to school to law school. It didn't end up working out maybe in the future, but definitely wanted to talk to her about her journey and learned a ton about, you know, the intersection of law and privacy and how that relates to security. And like everyone else said, just learning and gathering that information and using it in your day job is what's going to help you. And that, that is a good segue to certifications generally. And I find that the, a common question I see from students is there are a ton of certifications and guess what? There are, there's CISSP, there's IEPP, there's CompTIA, there's, I mean, you look at some people and like Rosemary said, it's like after their name is like 30 certifications. Um, and there are, to be honest, there's some, there's some jobs that are you starting to use those certifications as sort of a way to call through people. So I didn't know if any of you had any insight you could provide to the students on, you know, Rosemary, I think you're totally right. Like ask people who have the certification, that's a great tip. But if there's any other sort of tips, because especially when you're a student, it feels like you need to have that to sort of even like enter into the, the field. We say that there are some, like you were mentioning the CISSP, but that's kind of where you're in the middle of your career. Um, so anyone, it's, it's just an evaluation of the different certs is my answer because there's a security plus, but that's if you're more technical. So there isn't really any general one. And from everything that the panelists are saying too, it just kind of depends on if you want to be technical or not. And you can change your mind in the middle of everything. So like my only advice is just find people that do what you think that you want to do. And I know I said that already, but just go and meet people. Like that's my advice. Because you already know that I do that, but um, my advice is to meet people and ask them what they're doing and what interests they have. Like exactly like this. Connect with all of us on LinkedIn. I would also say, don't just focus on in, on technical certifications or even the privacy ones. You know, it, it, you know, with Austin being an in insurance, there's probably insurance certifications, and having those coupled with other certifications, you know, of technology, is a great fit. And I think that shows that you're not just a technical person, but you understand business as well. One of the differences in this realm, as opposed to, to say uh, a law area, is to practice law. You do have to pass the bar in states. Yeah. You do have to have the letters. These things are required. There are no required certifications to work in cybersecurity. Um, and I'm going to share a quick anecdote because it made me laugh. Um, yesterday, I was using LinkedIn not to look for jobs, um, but just uh, to, to do some research. And I saw a job posting. And the job posting said, 
New York DFS certification required. There's no such thing. <laughs> you see my exist. face, I was like, <laughs> It doesn't exist. There is no New York DFS certification that you could possibly have. So half the time, the people posting these jobs and recruiters, someone will say, well, we, we really want this person to be an expert in you know, the Department of Financial Services uh, 23, I forget the acronym, anyway, that particular area. And the person will say, oh, so you want like a certification? And I'll say, yes. So if you're looking at something that looks like a job you'd like, and there's a lot of alphabet soup in it, Google those things, figure out what they are, figure out if they're even real, because half the time they're not. And if they say, must have a CISSP, go figure out what the, the cybersecurity professional looks like and say, you know what, I don't have that cert, but I did an internship here in cybersecurity, right? Or, or whatever it is, look for commensurate experience, because unlike being an attorney, there is no requirement to have letters after your name in this job. And I think, you know, part of the value of going through the Drexel, the certification program and the MLS program is you don't have to have that JD, but it gives you that differentiator because there is no standard, um, you know, you can, it's not like there's a standardization, like Ryan said, where it's like, okay, if you've done X, we know you have this level. And a lot of people who work in this industry, it is just experience. It's just getting out there and sort of working in it and, and getting that experience. Um, that's changing slightly as we're seeing more undergrad programs and graduate programs, law schools, et cetera, that are starting to have these focuses in cyber and privacy. But that does it. I, I, I still think at the end of the day, the experience is going to be the most valuable thing because when you get in there and you're and you get dirty with a problem or a breach or or a technical challenge, that's you're going to learn so much in just doing that. And and one of the things that's great about sort of the Drexel programs generally is the co-op opportunities that allow you to sort of go out and work and have that hands-on experience because you can sort of see, you know, sort of how all of that, um, how it works in real life. Um, and so we've talked a lot about um, networking and relationship building. And so for the students that are on here, I mean, networking and relationship building in the times of COVID is challenging. So, you know, I, I want to put that out there. I think we're all understand that as a level set, um, you know, I miss seeing people in person. I think many of the panelists can, can attest to the fact that I was like out every day <laughs> at their various events and everything. And so I miss that. But if, are there recommendations for students on how to make those connections? Like Rosemary said, connect with people who have those certifications or how you have connected and made your, your networks. Because really that is, I find that that is the, the most valuable part of anything that you do in life. I just kind of find that there's always an organization and, and it's growing quite a bit now um, that, w that there's always an organization for something. And so whether it's the IAPP, um, which, which is, is obviously the International World Association oh. of Privacy Professionals, just so um, everyone's aware of what that is. <laughs> See, we talk in acronyms. I did it there. And, uh, <laughs> you know, but it's a very large organization. You can get involved. You can, well, before COVID, you could go to events and network and, and go to the receptions. You can, you know, it also has certifications, things like that. From a legal standpoint, you know, the American Bar Association has, has groups that do that. But what I've found is that, one, a lot of times, if you just go on there and Google, sometimes you find local organizations of just local professionals who are getting together in a certain area. Um, here in Nevada, it, it's kind of funny. There's like 12 privacy people total. And, you know, we got together one day and they were like, oh, my God, there's there's more of me out there. And I'm like, well, yeah, apparently there's 11 more of us. Um, <laughs> but it grows and it, and it kind of has this synergy that once you start connecting, more and more people come into that circle. Um, and so it's kind of exciting. So even just something as simple as doing a search, you'd be surprised how many local organizations you will find in addition to the big ones. And a lot of, you know, different industries have their own industry group um, down to the point where a lot of my firm, about a third of my firm does um, intellectual property, you know, patents, trademarks. Um, INTA, which is the, the International Trademark Association, has created a data privacy committee. And so Everywhere you go, a lot of them now are incorporating data privacy and cybersecurity in some fashion. So even at some place you don't think has it, check. You'd be surprised because it is starting to come more to the forefront and people are realizing the importance of it. So it, the opportunities are definitely out there. And it, if I went back, I know it's probably something Jordan's going to ask, but if I went back, that's the one thing I wish I'd done more of is get out there and meet different people. Aside from making those connections, you'll also, it'll also help you figure out what you want to do. You know, do you want to go back to law school? 
Do you want to avoid law school like the plague and, uh, you know, go more of a tech route? It'll help you figure that stuff out. I think Austin mentioned an organization called ISACA, if I'm not mistaken. I think you mentioned that. Um, so that's a good one. Uh, I can't remember what the acronym stands for, but it's uh, ISACA. Um, mm -hmm. It is a security focused area. And a lot of these orgs have student memberships. So for someone like me to join, it's like 250 bucks a year. If you're a student, it's like 30 bucks. So it's not, you know, don't go out one night, join a soccer, right? <laughs> um, but you can, you can use those and they are still doing webinars. They're still doing monthly meetings over Zoom or whatever. Um, looks like somebody posted a link there. Um, anyway, uh, oh, sorry, Rosemary. Um, <laughs> anyway, that's a good one. And there are definitely cheaper ways, student rates, et cetera, to get into those orgs. And I also think, um, you know, not to say that people are, I have found people always willing to talk um, and, and always reach out to people. I have found, like, I feel like um, the community that I have around me and the people that keep coming into that community have always been very welcoming, but especially students. It's so easy when you're a student to reach out to someone and say, hey, I'm a student, I'm, I'm doing this, can I chat with you? Because I think that there's a lot of people really find it, it, it very helpful for themselves and for that student to talk to them. So, so definitely use that. Um, but I want to pick up on something that Brian said and kick it over to Rosemary, because if it, if you, if you can't find, so Brian was saying like, look for these organizations, they could be there, but if you can't find it, you can always create it. So, um, for those of you who don't know, I started a group called the Philadelphia Women in Cybersecurity. So I was trying to find other women in cybersecurity because I was one of the only women in my company to get hired into a particular department. And I wanted to find other people and mentors and just in general, I'm very inquisitive, if you can't tell. Um, so <laughs> definitely search. And like Brian said, I Googled every kind of um, organization and there are tons. If you have not been on Meetup, get on Meetup. There are a million different things you can find. I don't even know, just Google it. <laughs> um, <laughs> but there's an opportunity to meet people and there's also virtual events going on. So my organization, anyone is welcome, male, female, any kind of gender trying to figure out what they wanna do on cybersecurity, come meet with us. Um, there are a lot of different people in the group, you know, CISO level all the way down to um, admins or anything like that. So, and we're all just trying to educate each other and become, you know, help with the security awareness and education of everyone in the organization. I think, I don't remember who said it specifically, but all different companies are trying to figure out what or how cybersecurity works, how privacy works, how they can deal with all these different new laws, regulations, everything. And you think that you're trying to find a job, they're trying to find you. So the more that you talk to people about what you know, and especially coming out of school and having some kind of certification, you're going to be ahead of the game. Like Brian was saying, he still doesn't understand why people come to him. That happens all the time. And Rosemary's organization is fantastic, Philadelphia Women in Cybersecurity. I mean, it's only been, it's only about two years old and there's so many people involved at three years old. Um, they do some great events um, and uh, is, they are now piloting a mentor program, which I think is going to be fantastic. And I can only say that because I'm part of the, the committee <laughs> that's doing the mentor program. And we're piloting this fall. And I think that's another great way to connect um, with people is to look for those mentors and those relationships. Um, you know, that's, that's really key. Um, so I, I, we only have a couple more minutes left. I'm enjoying this conversation thoroughly. Um, I could talk to everyone because uh, I don't get to see them all as much, but I wanted to end with each of the panelists answering this question, which is, um, and Brian sort of already sort of answered it for himself, but um, you know, a tip for your younger self, which is if you could go back in time you know, is there something that you would do differently or you would recommend that the students do to sort of improve their opportunities and their growth within the cyber and privacy field? Here's one of the reasons why I think the students would love this field. Love, love, love it. There's a lot of businesses out there where what you do is good for your business, could be good for your client. It has nothing really to do with protecting your community or protecting your nation. And cybersecurity is the number one threat to the United States. People say, wait a minute, my credit card number got stolen. How's that the number threat, number one threat? Because they didn't really see the big picture yet. They will, and the students will as time goes on. If somebody attacks a company, 
the easiest way to destroy a company nowadays is through the financial and reputational harm that it faces from a cyber event. It can mean the company can't do any work, period. They just can't provide any services. That wouldn't happen if you had a small fire in the building. You could still continue to do work. Or if some employees went and said, you know what, we're going off and moving, moving the division to another company. Law firms do that sometimes. People, one division leaves and they go to another law firm. The law firm still continues on. But a cyber event can shut everything down temporarily or for long term. Then let's look at, at, at municipal governments. If they're shut down because of a cyber event, what do you mean? Well, we actually got malicious code into their systems and there's no police re re response because the police can't respond because the communication system's down. Or we actually now can't collect taxes because they actually, the, the uh, municipal government is doing its, can't do its job because the systems are locked up. In Philadelphia right now, SEPTA has been under an attack for quite a few months right now and SEPTA can't do most of its work. Some of its employees are complaining about actually leaving because they can't do their work. So let's look at it on the national level. This is where I think my favorite part of it all is. If I, well, I actually know people know how to do it probably. If they were to actually infiltrate an electrical system and a power generator and shut down the power, but not just shutting the power down, you didn't cut the wires and then next thing you know, the crew comes out two days later and they fix the wires again. That's not what happens in this case. They've actually encrypted the network that runs the power system and the grid. You could actually have an incredibly economically devastating situation where there is no economy in a region or potentially nationally, but think of a social chaos with no traffic control signals, no police, no nothing. There's nothing working. No TikTok. Water, yeah, no, no TikTok, Facebook, exactly. No. Water, so you're not going to get water because water gets pumped by electricity up to the water tower and it runs down, but it gets pumped up when it's like low usage time. So this is a national security issue. And that's one of the things that most fascinates me. I'm a member of some groups that actually are working, do work with, you know, work with um, national agencies on the, these topics. And we do a lot of information sharing. I can tell you that every day or every week, I learn something new and interesting, just builds on the knowledge base. And I think the students will love that because a lot of times students are saying, I want to have a great career, but I want to be passionate about something. I want to be excited to go to work. I want to believe in something. So if you believe in your community, if you believe in your country, this totally, this field meets your needs. And then on top of that, you're helping your company and you're helping your family by, of course, or, or your whatever yourself by producing an income and having a great career. This is one of the most top to bottom, important career path you could have in the United States, and it's only gonna become more so, and the risks are increasing as we speak almost daily. So it's fascinating, so much to learn, and so much excitement, and it's a national issue that you're actually, in a way, providing a service to your country by doing something on the local level. Austin, that was so well said, and I don't think anything else needs to be said. Because you're just- <laughs> you are, I wanna hear more from you and everybody else. <laughs> Um, well, we're, I think we're up on the hour. And so um, I want to thank everybody, um, all the panelists for joining us today. This was fantastic. I really felt that this conversation provided a lot of value. I learned a lot. Um, I love talking to each and every single one of you. Um, you all have very unique paths into this area. And that's what we really wanted to show all of the students is that there's no right, wrong, you know, any way you can really come to this from so many different backgrounds and you can do so many unique um, things in cyber and, and privacy.